So we're looking at this passage in Matthew 7. We're down at verse 19. And it can be confusing. Matthew 7, 5, 7, 15 to 23. We're looking at 19 now. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, if you don't bear good fruit, you're not sent to hell because you're a sinner. You're sent to hell because you didn't believe. We're all sinners. God paid the penalty for all sin. So you don't go to hell because you sinned. You go to hell because you're not forgiven personally. Those sins are paid for. You're not, for, you're not personally forgiven, though. Every lifestyle devoid of good works is destroyed, burned up, but not the individual himself. So every tree that does bear good fruit, that is to say, every lifestyle which is not acceptable to God, which does not produce divine good, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It's not productive. But that doesn't mean the tree represents the person. The tree represents the person's actions. And they can't be acceptable. In other words, every lifestyle devoid of good works. Lifestyle is judged as unacceptable and burned up, just as is the hay, wood, and stubble of 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15. Remember that. See, you have to put these passages into perspective. 3, 11 to 15. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He paid a penalty for your sins. Sins are not the issue. But if any man builds on the foundation of gold, on the foundation with whose Christ, when they believed in him, that's the foundation of salvation, and you build it with faithfulness, gold, silver, and precious stones, or unfaithfulness, stones, wood, hay, and straw. Precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. Gold, silver, and precious stones, or the opposite, wood, hay, and straw. Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. Now, salvation is a gift. Reward is something that you do, and you get rewarded for it. If any man's work is burned up, he wouldn't stubble, he will suffer loss of rewards. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Okay, but there's the suffering of loss, because you realize in all of eternity, you haven't gotten anything that, uh, as a result of how you serve the Lord in your temporal life. And you realize what it could have been had you been faithful. Just stepped out a little bit more. Suffered a little bit more. But he himself will be saved yet as though through fire. Like a burning house, you get out of it. You don't go collecting uh, all kinds of precious things to your life, to your temporal life. Uh, because the, the fire, the house is burning down. So, every tree that does not bear good fruit, every lifestyle which is not acceptable to God, which does not produce divine good, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. In other words, every lifestyle devoid of good works is judged. The lifestyle, not the person, is judged as unacceptable and burned up just as the hay, wood, and stubble in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15. Judgment seat of Christ is the judgment of the believer's lifestyle. And whether it's sufficient to provide eternal rewards. This also represents the fruit of the unacceptable lifestyle that, of the believer, Haywood and Storm, uh, st Straw. The rotten fruit, the rotten fruit tree, could not represent an individual believer himself who was cast into the lake of fire because one is not condemned to the lake of fires of hell for producing bad fruit. For Christ paid the penalty for those sins, the sins of the whole world, and even Hitler's sins. One is condemned to hell for not placing one's faith in Christ as Savior. Furthermore, because you have to prove yourself as a person, is your lifestyle like Christ on a commensurate righteousness level? No. So you're going to fall short. Furthermore, the eternally secure believers cannot say that they do not produce bad fruit. Sins. 1 John 1, 8 and 10. Remember? 
This is where you should go as soon as you become a believer. Realize, how do you stay in good stead with God? Fellowship. Here it is, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we believers, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So you say, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm, I'm perfectly righteous. I, I haven't sinned all day. And you're a liar. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you confess where you went wrong. With one idea. You don't have to be inclusive of all things. Nice to mention as much as you can by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And then verse 10 is, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. See? So, we confess the sins that we know, known sins, and God is faithful and righteous to forgive us those sins we confess. And goes one step further. God says, I'm going to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. See, the slate is clean. You're perfectly righteous as so far as God is concerned because the Son, the Son paid the penalty for the sins of the whole world. See, but if we walk in the light, not according to the light, verse 7, 1 John 1, 7. As he, Christ, is himself in the light, we have fellowship with one another, we with Christ. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It's already paid for. All you have to do is believe. And in the case of temporal life, all you have to do is confess. Okay. See, the rotten tree could not represent an individual believer himself who is cast into the lake of fire because one is not condemned to the fires of hell for producing bad fruit. For Christ paid the penalty for the sins of the whole world. One is condemned to hell for not placing one's faith in Christ as Savior. Books are going to be open when you don't have Christ's propitiation and forgiveness by faith alone in Christ alone. So, then you have to look at books are open, great white throne judgment, to see if your lifestyle was as righteous as Christ is, and you know that's not going to be uh, coming out very well. So furthermore, eternally secure believers cannot say that they do not produce bad fruit or sins. 1 John 1, 8 and 10, which we read. Matthew seven twenty. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Them, the false prophets. The subject of this passage. If they're not acting properly, they could be an unbeliever. But these are prophets make themselves out to be prophets and to represent God. And the subject of this passage is uh, verse Matthew 7, 15. Who could be unbelievers or believers who teach false doctrine? So you know that they're not godly and uh, you don't want to be influenced by them, so you distance yourself from them. So, then, you will know the false teachers and prophets false prof oh, ph you will know the false teachers and the false prophets I might as well put false in to make sure from the true ones by the lives that they lead so you see a teacher prophet pastor and his lifestyle is rather unacceptable suggest you Keep your distance. So then you will know the false teachers from the true ones by the lives that they lead. Teachers of false doctrine will inevitably reflect their false belief system and their lifestyle. Often a lifestyle reflecting a system of legalistic rules which favors the lust pattern of their own particular sin natures. Moving on. Titus 1, 15-16. All kinds of gems in this book. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their consciences are defiled. A plural. Their mind and their oath. Well, that's, I don't want to change the wording. In this. Verse 16. They profess to know God, but their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. However, here's a however. It often takes a discerning believer who knows the word of God in order to, to detect the rotten fruit of a false prophet's lifestyle. It behooves every one of us to keep our acquaintances 
our pastors, uh, our teachers, and congregants in our particular local church in view and, and discern whether or not they're teaching from the Bible properly. And that's why you have to—you can't detect the rotten fruit of a false prophet's lifestyle or a pastor's lifestyle unless you know the Bible well enough. However, it takes a discerning believer, like I said, who knows the Word of God in order to detect the rotten fruit of a false prophet's lifestyle. Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12. Yeah, I couldn't quite see where Hebrews was. Here it is, 4.12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Don't be prejudiced. Just compare with Scripture and distance yourself when it doesn't come up reflecting what God's Word says. 1 Corinthians 2.15a But he who is spiritual appraises all things. You can judge things, critique them. Yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord? That he will instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ, the word of God. So, another point. An unfaithful lifestyle is not always an indicator of an unbeliever. Believers can act that way too. If the false doctrine which people often attribute to Matthew 7, 15 to 23 is instead true, that believers must continually prove out their salvation or not be saved at all, then scripture is in error when it exhorts believers not to behave like the world. If it is automatic, you don't have to say anything. You're just going to walk too far off the ground. So not behaving like the world, teaching that believers can seriously fall away from the faith but still be saved unto eternal life. Compare Ephesians 5, 1 to 17, 2, 10, 2, 11 to 13. This, this is a good one here. For if we, believers, died with him, died with Christ, that means we were on the cross, figuratively speaking, because what Christ did for us, he paid for it on the cross, and therefore it's as if we died with him on the cross for our sins. But he he attributes that to us, but we don't have to pay for our own sins. We will also live with him. So that means you believe. So you have eternal life, right? Next, if we endure, we will also reign with him. It doesn't say you'll live with him. It says you'll reign, you'll co-rule, co-own with him. If we deny him in our Christian life, he will also deny us. What does that mean? That means he denies the fact that you have something of value to show for in, this, in eternity. And it says if we are faithless, which might be part of denying him, he remains faithful to his promise to give us eternal life based on faith alone. For he cannot deny himself because we become part of body, the body of Christ. You have to read that carefully. God's word teaches that believers do sin, 1 John 1, 8 and 10, and may not show much evidence of being a believer, yet still make it to heaven. We just read 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15. Escape as one through fire. Hayward and Stubble burned up. Therefore, one cannot stretch this passage, passage to say that one can detect whether one is a believer or an unbeliever by one's lifestyle because Scripture does indicate that believers do have the potential at times of carrying on a lifestyle that does not reflect the fact that they are saved. Ephesians chapter 5, 1 through 20. It's a long passage. I can't read it. It takes too much time. Ephesians Five. Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ wants to love you and gave himself up for us and offering a sacrifice to God as a fragrant immoral aroma that gives all kinds of sinful actions not fitting to give thanks. For this you know certainly that no immoral or impure pure person or covetous rank who is an idolater has an inheritance. Now they may have a dwelling in heaven, the kingdom of God and Christ and God, but they don't inherit ownership. It's like your father, he said in his will to, about you, well, 